Bloomberg Audio Studios. Podcasts, radio, news. This is Bloomberg Business Week with Carol Masser and Tim Stenevec on Bloomberg Radio. We're live from the Bloomberg Green Festival in Seattle. It's a global collaboration between innovators, policymakers, entrepreneurs, artists, activists, musicians, and more. Also, we've got quite a few Bloomberg editors and reporters here, too. We really do. Uh, a lot of here. The whole team is in it. And we've also got a great series of panels coming up, including you know, the gamut of technology and innovation, the climate economy, greener living, and green policy. And one that really got our attention, you and I have been talking about this behind the scenes, it's about something called climate anxiety, folks. It is a thing. Yeah, in 2021, a study of 10,000 children and young people in 10 countries, it was published in the Lancet Planetary Health, found that 59% were very or extremely worried about climate change, and more than 45% said it had a negative effect, uh, negative effect on their daily life. Kira Bindram is Greener Living Editor at Bloomberg Green. She's moderating the panel about climate anxiety here at uh, the Green Festival. She joins us uh, on site here in Seattle. Really great to have you here with us. Uh, truth be told, I don't think we've talked about climate anxiety really that I, much. I didn't know about it until I saw the panel, but I understand it now. So tell us, if it's, it's a thing and it's, it's thing. manifesting. It's a thing. And I would dare say you've experienced it even if you've not thought about I it. I absolutely have experienced yeah. it. So it is a thing, it is a thing, as the study you cited is a big example of it, I think especially for young people, they have a longer future to look towards and are pretty worried about the state of the planet. But we also did a study, or not a study, a story with Green that talked to a bunch of therapists and mental health professionals about what they're seeing and the influx of people coming into therapy, wanting to talk about their anxiety about the climate is just exploding. It's just a big thing. Is this though, like, you know, somebody listening or watching right now could be like, okay, this is something that only privileged people think about. Because if you're thinking about where your next meal comes from, you're not concerned about, you know, necessarily what the climate is going to look like in 50 years. Yeah, I love that you brought that up. I think it's the opposite. I think it's really? a privilege to not think about it. And my experience of climate change, my ability to uh, move if I need to, or to recover mm. from a disaster if I need to, is very different than someone in a different socioeconomic situation, than someone in a different country who doesn't have the ability to react in the same way that I might. Uh, and then even just within like the population here, if you are older, if you are pregnant, if you are a young child, your ability to adapt to heat and extreme weather is different. So it's not anxiety in the sense of I have social anxiety, I have generalized uh, anxiety, which are real things, of course, but this isn't a disorder. This is people reacting to a very real threat that, depending on who you are, is actually like quite acute for you. It reminds me of, like, take us back to cavemen, right? Fight or flight. Like, that's what it's about. Like, if you are looking at your house and it's flooding, you've got yeah. to think about saving your lives, saving the lives yeah. of your family. Totally. And I think like taking a broad brush to climate anxiety. Yes, there are people who are just wake up and are worried about emissions. I bet a lot of them are in this building right, right. now. But if you are waking up worrying about paying your utility bill because your air conditioning is on all the time, or your kids are pulled out of school because it's too hot, like all of that to me is also climate anxiety. Yeah, we're getting notices about um, bad, no, it hasn't happened this year yet in New York, but bad air quality. You know, I remember my, my kids' summer camp was like closed one day because they mm -hmm. couldn't go outside as a result of bad air quality. Um, that's something that I never thought about when I was a kid. Totally. It's interesting when we did, uh, in New York, when the wildfire smoke sort of took over yeah. the sky, and not just New York, much of the, much of the US, um, we talked to a, a climate, like mental health professional, and she brought up this idea that comes from Yale, which is the spiral of silence. And that was a really good example because the sky was orange, we couldn't breathe, you weren't supposed to be outside, but I think especially New Yorkers, you just sort of go about your day and you look around and you say, everybody's acting normal, I'm gonna act normal. And you end up normalizing this thing that's going on. So one of the things that, that therapists say you should do to deal with climate anxiety is just talk about it, to just be out there and not sort of live alone in this fear. No, journalists never talk about <laughs> problems. I mean, we were obsessed with it. Like, I think it was totally. shocking, right? And I keep bringing up the Netflix series Extrapolations, but mm. it, it was going on and it was showing orange skies yes. and it was like, okay, it's a streaming series. No, this was happening in reality. Totally. Uh, yeah. My, my friend has been training for a huge bike race in Utah and it was canceled this weekend mm. because of the fires that are happening in Utah. Um, and look, that's obviously something a, a privileged person, you know, is, is doing. But it raises the question about where you can live in the country or in the world where this is not an issue. So you have fires in the West, you have uh, floods and hurricanes uh, in Texas and in Florida. Uh, New York, we're set to have a storm this weekend. Somebody told me, hey, make sure your dreams yeah. are clear because we're gonna get a lot of rain this weekend. Is there somewhere in the world that people can live where they can actually put their head in the sand and not worry about this? 
I'm sure like a real estate agent would give you a different <laughs> answer than I'm going to give you, but I think the most important answer is no. Like there's sort of, yes, there are pockets where like New Hampshire's nice this time of year, but I mean, we're in Seattle right now. I'm sure many of us who traveled here came thinking, oh, it'll be lovely. It'll be the Pacific Northwest. It'll be 70 degrees. It's, it's nice. Not, at 5 a.m. It's, it's nice. Yeah, it's hot. it's hot out. And like, this is, you know, a temperate area. So I think even if you are not in a place like California or Texas that literally experiences sort of the maelstrom of all of the extreme weather events, rain is getting more intense for everyone, flooding is more common for everyone, heat is a problem for everyone, I and mean, this is a planetary situation. My parents had a tornado warning in, in western New York this morning. Are you serious? Yeah, never happened before. Well, we, and we've seen that like in New Jersey where I grew yeah. up, and I mean, like, that never happens. Um, I am curious about treatment. Mm. Is it, and, and forgive me, this is going to sound really ignorant. I mean, and you talked, I think you touched on this a little bit. Is it different from, I know a lot of people who suffer from anxiety. What is the big difference? And then the treatments are the Yeah, different. I think it's sort of a blurry line, but I do think the distinction between anxiety as a mental health disorder and anxiety as a response to an acute threat is kind of different, but some of the tactics are the same. So there's sort of like internal tactic and external tactics. And one of the people we talked to gave this analogy of when you're like holding a ball underwater in the pool, eventually it's gonna come up. Like you sort of, the pressure will, will take you there. And that's the internal, like you need to manage your mental health, you need to take breaks, you need to talk with people about it, you need to make sure you don't feel isolated in this. And then the other side of it is a lot of people that we've talked to feel like when they do something that gives them a sense of agency, mm -hmm. that makes a difference. And so whether that's, I mean, talking about it isn't of itself an action, but participating in volunteer work, joining other groups, participating in planting trees, like anything that gets you out there and feeling like you're making a difference, it's daunting because the size of the challenge is so big, but is, doing something helps. Is it taken seriously by the medical community yet? That's a great question. I think yes and no. Like it is a little bit different in that it's not quite a mental health disorder, but I do think that it's taken seriously in the sense that if there is a rising group of people that is experiencing this, that mental health professionals are hearing about it, they have to take it seriously. I, I think one of the challenging things about this is that it can feel like, I bet to a lot of people, it's not something they have control over. Totally. And whereas a lot of other types of anxiety, I think, are, are ones mm -hmm. that people can be given tools to, right. to deal with. But this is sort of like, this is existential. Yeah. So my team works on greener living, which is the sort yeah. of like, how do you decarbonize your own life? And there's this tension there of your ability as an individual to affect change relative to big companies, governments is small, but it does a lot for you internally to feel like you have some stakes in this and to feel like you're doing something in the same way inequality stresses me out every day and I feel better about it if I volunteer at a soup kitchen, if I like participate in solving the problem, even though the, the scale of the problem is so large. So I think that's the takeaway for people. Doing something helps, helps you even if it's a drop in a much larger bucket. Um, it was something interesting in a Bloomberg story about the connection between climate anxiety and climate denial. Mm. So, and it's interesting, I think they, they it quoted, and I'm just gonna read my notes, psychotherapist Caroline Hickman, the conspiracy theorists are reassuring, if you can't tolerate anxiety, you will then spin off into believing somebody who gives you false promises. I just thought that was kind of interesting. Yeah. The people that we're speaking with on the panel later, I know that their view is climate denial is a form of climate anxiety. It is a way of making your brain ignore the problem as a way of not facing it. I don't know if everyone who denies climate change would agree with that yeah. assessment, but I think that's fair. It is a coping mechanism. Okay, so without getting too personal, can you give us some ways to cope with this? Because you know, you mentioned volunteering at a soup kitchen to help help yep. yeah. with inequality. What do people, I mean, you can separate your recycling until the cows come home, but it's not gonna help the global temperature. <laughs> I think in terms of like tactile things you could do, like the biggest things you can do for your own carbon footprint are changing what you eat, changing your home energy mix if you are in a position to be able to do that, um, thinking about what you wear and how much waste you're producing. But then in terms of like things you can do out in the world, we talked to people who literally got into the field of climate in some capacity for their work, even though it put them closer to the problem, it gave them a feeling that every day they were, every day they were dealing with it. People who join community groups, people who go to therapy, just anything that doesn't make it something you live with in isolation. Do you, do you think there's gonna be a moment that we just don't get on planes? Like we were all thinking about this, getting ready for this, so many people flying here to mm -hmm. do it. Like, is there a point where we start to, people really significantly, like, hold back on things? Because of the carbon footprint of it? Yeah. And and they're seeing the impact of, of you know, climate change. Yeah. I'm not sure. I do think there's a point at which flying becomes very expensive, and so it becomes even more stratified. Um, it is technically a small portion of the carbon footprint, but things like private jets and yachts, like, these are the things that, even though they're small pieces of the emissions pie, are so unnecessary <laughs> that, like, these feel like the, the pieces of low-hanging fruit. I do think people will 
bake climate change into more of their day-to-day -day thinking yeah. and planning and decision-making and I think young people that will feel quite normal to them and we won't even realize it's happening that we're starting to make so many decisions with climate in mind. I've been oh. telling you for years to sell that private check, Carol. <laughs> Time. James, time to sell. <laughs> All right, Kira, thank you so much. Thank really looking guys. forward to the panel. Uh, Kira Bindram is Greener Living Editor here at Bloomberg Green. It's a thing, this whole area. We got more from Seattle coming up in just a minute. This is Business Week. We are at the Bloomberg Green Festival. Carol Masterton, Stanovic Live here on Bloomberg Business Week. Our guest has been sitting here patiently. We kind of want to do a little bit of a reset with him. He's Jeremy Sampson. He's CEO of the Travel Foundation. We mentioned earlier it's an independent charity that works with tourism companies and organizations to make tourism benefit both the environment and the communities where it's happening. Jeremy, um, good to have you here. Let's just reset. We have a nice chunk of time. Sure. Remind us, um, for those who maybe are not familiar with your organization, what you guys are doing and what you're looking to to really solve. Sure. Um, you know, we um, we exist uh, primarily to, to represent a voice that is, is often not represented in the travel and tourism sector, um, which are the communities um, it, that host travel, uh, in, that, ha that host travelers and, 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 um, and, and tourism uh, activities and experiences, and the environment in which uh, the industry depends on, you know, the, the 80% of travel and tourism is actually coastal, um, wow. and so uh, you know the, the beaches, the um, the marine infrastructure that, that that industry depends on has often not been so kind to, mm -hmm. um, which is um, is potentially not good business sense. So we've been advocating um, for for those two stakeholders in, in, in a sense um, by helping to uh, enable uh, bolster the enabling environment for sustainability climate action, uh, increased equity in the tourism economy to thrive. Um, the, the sector is, um, like many, um, very focused on growth, um, very focused on... Especially after the pandemic, right? Yeah, it's well, it's been, it's been uh, peaks and valleys for years. There was 9-11, mm -hmm. there was the economic downturn in 2008, there was COVID. Each of those took the industry to its knees, and then, and then there's been a, a great recovery story ever since. And, and oftentimes those, um, those recoveries have, have butted heads with issues of sustainability. But at the end of the day, um, we believe that sustainability is not a, not a sideshow or, or a tick box, but rather something that to be integrated into day-to-day decision-making. Well, some companies have integrated it to try to get consumers to make decisions. You can go to certain online travel agency booking websites mm -hmm. when you're booking a flight. I think actually ours does this, mm -hmm. Carol, internally. When you it look does. at a flight, it has how much yeah. carbon That's right. is released. I got a confession to make. I completely ignore that number. Am I a bad person? You look more at the plane <laughs> you're flying yeah, on. Yeah, I look at the time. I look at the time of the flight. That's like what listen, I look at. Listen, I, I'm probably one of the world's. Uh, most well-known experts in sustainable travel, and I have a horrible time making good decisions about sustainability when I really? when I do my own personal travel. Why? The information is either um, you know uh, too confusing, so you want to you want to find uh, find out the basics about a place or about a business, and it's buried somewhere. Um, you want to um, you, you you have some information that's coming to you, but it's usually not contextualized. And, and is, is part of a much wider range of decision making that you're doing as a, as a person. And, and ultimately, we don't really believe that individual, you know, individual decisions are, are really where it's, what it's all about, but what, rather okay. systems change within the industry and, and designing sustainability right, in, right into the system and things that are unsustainable out because there's no reason we should even be offering things that are destroying the climate to, um, Jer you know, to the end user. Jeremy, one thing I wonder, like I think about it when you order food now, right? The calories are up there, yep. right? And I think about um, when I buy some products or food, I turn around and I look at the labels more than I've ever before. Is there some kind of labeling or metric that you can really apply across the travel industry that will make us all kind of think differently and be more concerned. So this is coming. And, and change our habits. This is coming and there's been a, there's been a great movement, especially among the, the travel tech space, so the, the um, online travel agents like Booking.com, Expedia, Airbnb, to have a, a common framework for reporting to, to consumers. For many years there, were, there was a badge here, a leaf here, a circle here, no one knew what it meant. Yeah. And, and we really did a poor job of aligning those, um, you know, that communication. I always assume a leaf is good. Just like, what does yeah, that mean though? I don't know, it, it seems good. It's green. It seems good. Yeah, yeah, it seems it, good. Who doesn't like leaves? But it actually <laughs> it actually responds to one of the big um, the big risks there, which is that most people associate sustainability with tree hugging, 
okay, we, we uh, hung up our towels and we used, we yeah. didn't use plastic I went to Costa Rica and, and I planted a tree. Exactly. Problem solved. The, the, the challenge is much more holistic when it comes to sustainability. And it's also, the industry is incredibly fragmented. So it's not a sector at all. It's really a bunch of sectors mashed up into one. So on any given trip, even a basic one, you might be traveling with a car rental agency, uh, a, uh, a hotel, an activity provider, a res several restaurants mm -hmm. in a destination that is its own, you know, and each of them are trying to take responsibility for their piece of the pie. And there's not a lot of alignment and convening that brings it all together to say, you know, here's the experience that you're having and, and here's the things that really matter. Where does government come in? We mentioned the idea of uh, entrance, ta entrance tax that tourists have to pay in cities such as Venice. Increasingly, we're starting to see local municipalities push back against Airbnb. That's right. Some pushing it back against new hotel construction. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah. What's the balance like what's the balance with, with governments? So tourism has long been the most unregulated sector in the world, even behind oil and gas. And um, part of that comes from the the this fragmentation. It's it's really challenging to to um, regulate something that is so fragmented and in, and, and and really could sort of could sort of beat the system in many ways. And, and the concentration of, of sort of power and influence has, has shifted because now it sits with the, the big tech companies, which for a long time uh, said, we're not even in the travel industry, we're, te we're tech platforms, yeah. you know? Um, so, uh, but, so, so government is, is increasingly needed actually, I think, to, find, to set those limits. Until the sort of 2010 uh, time period, it was, it was easier to manage the capacity in a place, right? Like you had only a certain number of hotel rooms and a certain number of people could fill them and you were sort of at capacity. Then two things happened, Airbnb and, and short-term rentals really changed the game. All of a sudden there were infinite rooms in a place and short, uh, long, short haul flights became very cheap, especially in Europe where you mm -hmm. had people flying to London, Barcelona for 10 quid for the weekend, which while it made it more accessible and, and people could do that, you know, it was a nice thing for, for, for your pocketbook, it actually changed the game in wow. terms of numbers. All of a sudden, Barcelona, Venice, these places were totally overwhelmed with people. Um, it's all possible, you can manage a whole lot of people, but there has to be the, the planning in the background to be able to, to make sure that the demand does not outstrip the resources and capacity that are available. What is the worst thing? What makes tourism so bad for the environment? I have a list for you. Is it planes? Is it cars? Is it cruise ships? Is it food and food waste? Is it garbage? What are the biggest contributing factors? Or, your, or is it kind of all above? Yeah. Um, so we've done the research on this, and when it comes to climate change specifically um, and carbon emissions, uh, you know, air travel is particularly polluting. We know this. Um, air travel is also one of the most difficult to decarbonize. Uh, we also know this. Um, right now, sustainable aviation fuel is only able to fuel the, the fleet of airplanes that fly around the world um, for less than one day of all of the, yeah, of all wow. the, the pla yeah. So we're, no, we're nowhere near the scale of the solution that will be required for air to decarbonize. Electrification might help, but it's, you know, to replace a fleet of planes, it's not an easy thing to do. Yeah. Um, in, in, our, in our report, which I, I think we'll get into in a moment, um, what we're suggesting actually, and we've done the modeling, is that um, it, it, there's more nuance than, has been in, than there has been in this sort of debate. It's not just a degrowth versus growth conversation or a flight shame, you should never fly. And we were able to show that the industry could actually achieve its climate targets um, by simply uh, um, uh, um, maintaining growth at around two, 2019 levels huh. of long haul, uh, long haul flights. So it's the long haul flights that are It's the really long concerning. haul flights. Um, uh, Shanghai to Sid Sydney mm -hmm. is about the sort of average long okay. haul flight that we studied. Um, you know, we have a couple minutes left and, and one thing that I'm really interested in this, uh, is this idea of over tourism mm -hmm. and the idea that a tourist dollar spent somewhere doesn't necessarily go to the local community. That's right. This is a new part of a conversation that's happening because for years we were taught oh, we should go here because it supports the local economy. Not that simple, right? How do we quantify that? This is climate justice, right, a little bit? Well, a, a little bit. I yeah. mean, there's a couple other issues at play here that I think are really important. On the over-tourism front, um, over-tourism itself is a symptom rather than a, than a root issue. Yeah. What you see there is, is again, um, places that have been stripped away from their ability to, 
to um, manage the, the fact that, that the demand and, and number of people is, is outpacing the, the resources that are available. Um, over tourism could be one person if that one person is in the wrong place at the wrong time and the community is not ready to provide them with the, the wastewater and energy services, for example, that have that they will need mm. to be a visitor in their yeah. in their community. It doesn't take much. We've all been in the developing world, right, where you're somewhere and it's just the systems all of a sudden. You feel start to you break feel down. it, yep. you feel that it's broken. It gets but stressed it, pretty quickly. But it is solvable actually, yeah. and it's not just about crowds. Um, when it comes to this issue of, of equity. Uh, you know, the industry has long had this uh, platitude uh, uh, that, in, that travel is a force for good. Uh, I tend to believe, actually, that the industry can be a force for good, but it doesn't do so just by showing up in a place. That's trickle-down economics. And, and, and trickle-down economics, I'm afraid, um, you know, has, has, has not necessarily worked. Um, it doesn't just show up and sort of rain down uh, uh, profit and, and, and wealth on local people. Interestingly, uh, small and medium-sized businesses are the beating heart of travel and tourism. When you go to a place, right. that's who you interact with. So um, when destination uh, management organizations, when businesses are acting with intentionality about spreading that well, spreading the, uh, the, the value of the tourism dollar, um, there, there are ways to make that happen, but it doesn't just happen without some, some real thought into how to, how to maximize that equity and make sure that those communities are, are actually feeling that love. Just got about 25 seconds. If you could change sure. one thing in the tourism industry, just quickly, what would you do? Yeah. Um, you could so, flip a switch, what would it do, just quickly? Uh, I would cut marketing budgets <laughs> because, um, and, and don't get me wrong, I'm a marketer. So don't bring in more travelers? No, not necessarily. Uh. We, I believe in marketing, but the balance is way out of whack. We have an hmm. industry that markets itself to death and, and spends very little on issues around, around climate change, which to me huh. pose a great threat to business. So I think uh, shifting that balance just a little bit would make a huge difference. All right. Listen, so glad we got some time. I know we had some breaking news, but thank you so this much. Great. Yeah, thank you, you so much. You're, you're thanks welcome. Thanks for having me and uh, appreciate the thoughtful conversation. You bet. Good luck at Green. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Bye-bye. Jeremy Sampson, CEO of the Travel Foundation, live from the Bloomberg Green Festival.